It is such an honor to come back to the University of Denver. I had such a formative experience here, like I'm sure many of you, and it changed the course of my career, much of which is yet to be written. I'd like to speak a little bit about my background, um, how I joined the military and the career that Kristen shed some light into, and then talk about the adventure of writing this book with General David Petraeus, and then um, draw your attention to something that's very near and dear to my heart, the status of our veterans right now and those service members who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, just so you know, um, um, we have the book in the back, but book proceeds are going to a wounded warrior group called Team Red, White, and Blue. And they use physical fitness to help wounded warriors sort of find their new normal, find a new organization to belong to. And I feel strongly that each of us can contribute in some way. Mentoring a veteran, finding a group to contribute to. Um, so I'll come back to that at the end. Um, I, I wanted to thank everyone that helped put this together. I think uh, Alicia is not here. She had to help her mother with something. And, and Sherry, where are you? Um, and everyone else that was involved in bringing this, this event together. And Chancellor for having the vision to bring this network back together, um, to share, to find common ground, to continue your education. I like that it's linked to the title of my book, The Education of General David Petraeus. And um, I wanted to raise one of my favorite quotes that I've thought about since I was in high school. It's by Alfred Lord Tennyson. I am a part of all that I have met. And that's so true for each of us. We're a part of the people that we meet. We're a part of the experiences we've had, the education we've had. And that's kind of how I approached writing the book about General David Petraeus' education, which hasn't stopped even now as he's the director of the CIA. Um, but I want to encourage you to continue to come to events like these, to share with each other, and to encourage each other to, to uh, expand your horizons, get outside your comfort zone, and continue to learn. So why did I join the military? When I was born in 1972, women only made up 1.8% of the United States military. Now we make up about 15%. But I remember in high school watching the first Gulf War on, on I was going to say unravel, <laughs> but uh, reveal itself. And I spoke to a group of students today, none of whom were old enough to really remember it, but thankfully this crowd probably can. But do, do you remember the shock and awe campaign? That war was over in a couple of days. And I was thinking as a young high school student, um, first that I really wanted to become a diplomat and get into international affairs, but I watched the war and I thought, as a woman, if I can understand that instrument of power, the military that could conduct this war, and stop this tyrant, Saddam Hussein, I could be a better diplomat or whatever it was I was going to pursue. So I got a wild and crazy idea to apply to the Air Force Academy. Now, mind you, I grew up in North Dakota. And growing up, I thought West Point was in North Dakota. I didn't really know what it was. Very removed from, from the military. I had applied to Georgetown and been accepted. And so that was the course I was going to go. But I went through the whole process of applying to a military academy. You have to get psychological testing. There's a physical fitness test. And you have to get a nomination from a senator or a congressman or the vice president or president. And I was kind of going through the motions. I, I, the idea of joining the military kind of softened after I got into school and thought more about um, being an ambassador. But once you go through so much effort, to apply for something like that, um, you really start to question, should I, should I go all the way or just cut my losses? Well, I was sitting in front of my senator, and I had driven back from our high school state basketball championship before the championship game, uh, which we were in. And I sat with him, and he said, Paula, you showed leadership qualities. You were state student council president and, and orchestra concert mistress and lots of great stuff. And you said you wanted to get into international diplomacy and be a world leader, but you've never said you wanted to fly. I have three students sitting outside my door. It's been their life dream, all 18 years of their life, to, to be a pilot. Why should I give you my nomination to the Air Force Academy instead of them? So being very competitive, you can imagine my heart just sank. But before I could answer, he said, I'd like to instead offer you my appointment to West Point, the United States Military Academy the training to be a leader, to get into international relations, to understand this instrument of power. I'm sure I didn't use that term as an 18-year-old, but um, you will get all the same benefits, he said. And I thought, again, I'm putting a lot of time and effort into this. I just left our championship game. I can drive back and make it. But I think I'm going to go for this. And thus, 
sort of serendipitous uh, opportunity, and it changed um, the course of my life. So I went off to West Point and had no idea what I was getting into. We had to wear uniforms 24 hours a day, including pajamas. Uh, we had to march, and I had to get some additional instruction for that. It was difficult. But at the end of the day, I loved it. Women were only 10% of the military academy in 1991 when I entered. Now women make up 17% of that body. And it was the most challenging experience, as you can imagine. The focus is on holistic development of the individual, not just academics, like most colleges, but on physical fitness. Because as an army officer, your body is the ultimate weapon system. You need to be able to get yourself in and out of a dangerous situation and rely on your fitness to do that. But obviously, there was a great focus on leadership and military bearing and ethics and morality. And so I love that experience, and it really shaped my, my code of ethics, if you will. The mantra at West Point is duty, honor, country. And embracing those sort of values has been um, a guiding light in my life. I don't, I'm not mo motivated by making a lot of money, but I'm very motivated about trying to make a difference in the world in whatever way I can. And I think that this institution embodies that as well and tries to encourage um, college students and graduate students, at least that was my experience at the, at the Corbell School, GSIS at the time. In any case, after West Point, um, I went off to Korea for my first assignment. As you can imagine, coming from rural North Dakota, it was very exotic, and I loved it. But my first, my first um, interaction with my unit was kind of eye-opening. So remember, I just graduated from the United States Military Academy. I was very proud of myself, as all cadets are and all, all young graduates are, thinking we're the cream of the crop. And I was sent to meet my unit at the DMZ, Demilitarized Zone, right on the border. And I wanted to impress them, of course. Well, they, um, they were camped out for the night. They were deployed along the, the DMZ, listening to North Korean communications and jamming and so forth. And I joined them the first night. Um, I was camping out with them, too, in our tent. And after about an hour uh, of sleep, I was miserable. I had jet lag. Frostbite was sure to, to get me while I was there. But after about an hour of sleep, my platoon sergeant reaches over and wiggles me and wakes me up. He said, ma'am, look up. What do you see? And I'm thinking, oh, this is the test for the lieutenant from West Point. I have to prove my keen intellect. And so I looked up, and I said, platoon sergeant, I see stars. He said, ma'am, what does that tell you? I said, trying to think of a clever response, well, astrologically, it tells me there are billions of stars and planets in the universe, and we are but insignificant in all of it. No response. I said, theologically, it tells me God is great, and we must have a greater calling in life. No response. So I tried the military approach. Meteorologically, it tells me we're going to have a great day of training tomorrow. No response. So I said, platoon sergeant, what does it tell you? He said, ma'am, someone stole our tent. <laughs> so I never tried to be an intellect after that or show any, give any kind of profound insight, and I, I certainly won't tonight. But uh, it was a good wake-up call for young Lieutenant Paula Crams at the time. Uh, anyhow, Korea was a wonderful tour for me. I learned to be a leader in that small environment of a platoon of about um, 30 men and one women, woman. Um, after that, I went to Europe and was assigned to the headquarters of the U.S. Army in Europe. I was a senior analyst for the Middle East and Africa. So great opportunity for a 20-something-year-old to travel throughout Africa to teach Ghanaians how to um, do a search and seizure on a ship that may be taken over by pirates, for example. I uh, went to Liberia and worked with the embassy personnel to come up with a non-combatant evacuation plan. Went to West Africa and East Africa, a lot of tremendous opportunities that were eye-opening and very broadening, again, for a, a young girl from, from North Dakota. After that, uh, I served in Europe in various positions and got into the counterterrorism world, where I've remained ever since. And the work we were doing before 9-11 was obviously still focused on transnational terrorism. These guys have been around a while. Um, but I decided at some point, when my husband was deployed to the Balkans and, and I was in Africa, and then I was sent to Kosovo and he was sent to Africa, that it was becoming very difficult to start a family. So we both decided to leave active duty. My husband um, was a flight surgeon, a clinic commander, and 
we had decided before we got married that every other move would be the other person's choice since we both were very career oriented. And he chose Colorado, he chose Denver to come back to the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center here um, to pursue radiology residency. And I thought, my career is international relations and counterterrorism. What am I going to do in Denver besides ski, which was, my, was a wonderful consolation prize, as you can imagine. But I didn't have to think about it long. We were only here a month when 9-11 happened, and I was recalled involuntarily back to active duty. I was sent off to join the Special Operations Command and um, worked on putting together terrorist targeting packages for our special forces who were doing infiltrations into North Africa, the Caucasus, Afghanistan, and other parts of the world. So I was using all source intelligence. Um, it felt like a very important mission, and I did feel like I was contributing to, to the greater good. After that tour, I came back to Colorado, and guess what? Uncle Sam called again, and I got mobilized um, two more times. But thankfully, it was to the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force here in Denver. And it was while I was serving with the task force here that I thought I needed to expand my horizons and that the University of Denver Graduate School of International Studies, the Corbell School, would be a wonderful place to do that. So I applied for the one-year program here. And let me say that it was a, a wake-up call. I had, this, had had an amazing experience, traveled and lived in several different continents, very worldly, but I had no writing skills, um, poor communication skills, very few analytic skills. And I realized that this was a very important stepping stone for me to expand and become the professional that I aspired to be. My long-term goal had always be, been to become National Security Advisor. So if you can't write, you can't analyze problems, um, and you can't speak very well, that's very difficult to get where you want to go. In any case, uh, the one-year program turned into a two-year program because I loved it so much. And I eventually ended up going full-time once I finished my, my tour at the FBI. And my experience here was enriched by professors like Karen Festi, who teaches in the Conflict Resolution Program. And Karen taught me something very important. That instrument of power, the military, well, we can't shoot our way or kill our way or bomb our way out of every conflict. Sometimes diplomacy is critical. And um, I learned some great skills in her class. I can negotiate with my five and six-year-old insurgents at home now. Very helpful. I actually um, became an ombudsperson for Harvard University when I went, and that was because of the skills I gained in, in, in Karen's class and some of the practical work we did in the community here, negotiating the, with you know, the neighbors who had a barking dog conflict, for example. So I'm very grateful for, for those skills. Um, also, Nancy Petrie, who's here with us this evening, sponsored a scholarship for me to travel to the Middle East. And I went back to Jordan to study Arabic. And I was not only studying Arabic, but I was writing my thesis for the graduate school. My thesis was looking at when you can negotiate with terrorists. And I think I framed it as extremists. And I was looking at Jewish extremists on settlements and, and Muslim extremists in refugee camps and, and Hamas and, and some other organizations. And I actually had the opportunity to interview Hamas members and travel all over the Middle East. I'd been there before on an exchange program as a cadet from West Point. But that was during a very peaceful time. On this trip, I was five month, or a couple months pregnant. And um, it, was, it was kind of fun. I ate a lot of hummus. You probably all had hummus. I ate a lot of baba ganoush. And my Middle East friends started to call my, my unborn child baby ganoush, which was cute. The good thing I didn't eat a lot of falafel. That would be kind of an interesting nickname. In any case, I'm so grateful, Nancy, for that experience. And um, I was able to apply for something called the National Security Education Program Boren Fellowship, which also helped to facilitate my study of, of Arabic in, in the region. And all of that and those experiences and my professors who mentored me and former Dean Tom Fair really encouraged me that um, the skills that you gain in graduate school were, were truly essential for what I wanted to do next. So after um, we left Denver, we went off to Boston and I studied at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And that's where I met General David Petraeus. I'd never crossed paths with him while in uniform, even though he's a West Pointer. We had alumni events like this, um, just hadn't had the opportunity to interact with him. He came back to speak about the counterinsurgency manual he, was, he had drafted and was publishing and was going to use as a sort of guiding blueprint for how to quell the violence in Iraq. And if you recall in 2006, that war was at a nadir. About 120,000 US troops were dying each month um, around May in, in the middle of that year. 
I don't think there was a lot of public support for the war. I know that I, as a military officer, reservist at that point, had become ostensibly a conscientious objector, knowing that there, there were no weapons of mass destruction, the precedent for going in was wrong, and we had no plan for an exit. We needed a visionary leader. So you probably remember General Petraeus kind of became a celebrity leader at that point. And I was fascinated with this individual who could get the big idea right. He could communicate it to the public to garner support. Um, he could communicate it to the troops to show us how we're going to achieve our objectives there. He could oversee the execution of the implementation, which was very critical. And he could create a lessons learned feedback mechanism for our institution, the Army, Department of Defense, to learn from our mistakes and not make them again, because we continually did that in Iraq for many years. We were focused only on killing the enemy and not protecting the population. Um, but also to learn best practices and then to share those across the force so that we are, we are doing no harm, uh, if that's possible, in war. In any case, I started to work with him, not as, um, not as a military officer, but while I was at Harvard, I also ran the Jepson Center for Counterterrorism Studies at, at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And I commissioned students to do research projects that would support his work in Iraq. When he came back from Iraq and the war had, um, the violence had subsided uh, for all intents and purposes, and I realized that there was an opportunity to write about this transform, transformational leader. So I proposed writing a uh, dissertation using him as a case study. And I wanted to look again at his education. What, was, what were the schooling, the educational experiences he had at West Point and at Princeton where he pursued a PhD and, and throughout the military through Command and General Staff College and the other schools that we have to go to? What were the experiences he had in Haiti, doing peacekeeping and nation building there, in Bosnia, conducting a hunt for war criminals, and uh, in other deployments that he had that informed his decision making when he went to Iraq? And more importantly, I thought, back to the network and the importance of, of the strength of strong and weak ties, who, who were the people that influenced him most? His mentors, his peers, but also his subordinates, from whom I think he got the best big ideas. Um, so I started to write this dissertation and had unprecedented access in part because I was a West Pointer, he was a West Pointer, but also because uh, we were both runners. And in the, in the introduction in the book, I kind of talk about how I, I sealed the deal with him. Our first interview in person was on a run. And I had proposed this because I knew it was a rite of passage for many of his former aides to kind of get in the inner circle, you had to be a runner. Well, I had run in high school, I'd run in college, um, I'd been a, a sponsored triathlete when we lived here in Colorado, so I loved physical fitness, but I didn't think he knew anything about me in that regard. So we went for a run, we started at the Pentagon, and I had my, my recorder. Um, I thought if I asked him questions that he had to give lengthy answers to, he would he would be more winded than I was. but. He was smarter than I was. He'd say yes or no, or he'd just ask a question in return or say, that's classified, next. Anyhow, at some point, at about mile three or four, he started to pick up the pace. And I knew this was coming. He, it, I called it the boiling frog approach, because you don't know that the water's getting hotter and hotter. In any case, I realized what was going on, and I decided to shut off the recorder and race him. And I was told never to beat him. Keep up with him, and you earn it's the rite of passage, but don't beat him, because He's a guy, you're a girl, and he's a celebrity, and you're no, you know, you're a soccer mom. Uh, in any case, he started elbowing me, and it was over. So, um, long story short, I did beat him. We got, we got down to a six-minute mile pace, and I later found out that he was going through uh, radiation treatment for prostate cancer. So it didn't really count, but it was a rite of passage and a, and a great sort of rapport builder with him. So. After um, a couple of years, about a year and a half of just interviewing him on a few runs, but mostly via email, he was selected to go to Afghanistan. And I proposed turning my dissertation, which was about a third of the way finished, into a book. And I thought it would be this intellectual history. I wanted to chronicle the war through the strategic commander's eyes to show how someone at that level manages a coalition of 48 countries, how they give energy to the public and to their troopers. Um, how you turn a failing situation around, if that's, if that's possible. And so he was gracious enough to allow me to travel with him 
uh, on battlefield circulations, to meetings with Afghans, to private meetings with his staff, and out to the Hindu Kush and to the border of Pakistan to meet with young troopers. And I really tried to document in the book what his principles of strategic leadership were all about. I mentioned some of those earlier. One, get the big idea right. Two, communicate it. If the trooper in the field doesn't know that the objective is to take the hill, then he's going to sit in his tent and play Angry Birds or you know, sit on email or something else. But if you don't communicate that the focus is to protect the population, then our conventional mindset in the military is just to kill, kill, kill. And so communication was a big, um, a great mechanism, a great tool and skill that he had. And I try to, again, show that in the book.